This audiobook is a personal endeavor and is for personal use only. Master Key System by Charles Hainel. Introduction Nature compels us all to move through life. We could not remain stationary however much we wished. Every right thinking person wants not merely to move through life like a sound producing, perambulating plant, but to develop, to improve, and to continue the development mentally to the close of physical life. This development can occur only through the improvement of the quality of individual thought and the ideals, actions and conditions that arise as a consequence. Hence a study of the creative processes of thought and how to apply them is of supreme importance to each one of us. This knowledge is the means whereby the evolution of human life on earth may be hastened and uplifted in the process. Humanity ardently seeks, the truth, and explores every avenue to it. In this process it has produced a special literature, which ranges the whole gamut of thought from the trivial to the sublime, up from divination, through all the philosophies, to the final lofty truth of, the master key. The master key is here given to the world as a means of tapping the great cosmic intelligence and attracting from it that which corresponds to the ambitions, and aspirations of each reader. Everything and institution we see around us created by human agency, had first to exist as a thought in some human mind. Thought therefore is constructive. Human thought is the spiritual power of the cosmos operating through its creature man, the master key, instructs the reader how to use that power, and use it both constructively and creatively. The things and conditions we desire to become realities we must first create in thought, the master key explains and guides the process. The master key, teaching has hitherto been published in the form of a correspondence course of 24 lessons, delivered to students one per week for 24 weeks. The reader, who now receives the whole 24 parts at one time, is warned not to attempt to read the book like a novel, but to treat it as a course of study and conscientiously to imbibe the meaning of each part reading and re-reading one part only per week before proceeding to the next. Otherwise the later parts will tend to be misunderstood and the reader's time and money will be wasted. Used as thus instructed, the master key, will make of the reader a greater, better personality, and equipped with a new power to achieve any worthy personal purpose and a new ability to enjoy life's beauty and wonder. F. H. Burgess Author's Introduction 1. Before any environment, successful or otherwise, can be created, action of some kind is necessary, and before any action is possible, there must be thought of some kind, either conscious or unconscious, and as thought is a product of mind, it becomes evident that mind is the creative center from which all activities proceed. It is not expected that any of the inherent laws which govern the modern business world as it is at present constituted can be suspended or repealed by any force on the same plane, but it is axiomatic that a higher law may overcome a lower one. Tree life causes the sap to ascend, not by repealing the law of gravity but by surmounting it. To control circumstances a knowledge of certain scientific principles of mind action is required. Such knowledge is a most valuable asset. It may be gained by degrees and put into practice as fast as learned. Power over circumstances is one of its fruits, health, harmony and prosperity are assets upon its balance sheet. It costs only the labor of harvesting its great resources. The naturalist who spends much of his time in observing visible phenomena is constantly creating power in that portion of his brain set apart for observation. The result is that he becomes very much more expert and skillful in knowing what he sees, and grasping an infinite number of details at a glance, than does his unobserving friend. He has reached this facility by exercise of his brain. He deliberately chose to enlarge his brain power in the line of observation, so he deliberately exercised that special faculty, over and over, with increasing attention and concentration. Now we have the result a man learned in the law of observation far above his fellows. Or, on the other hand, one can, by stolid inaction, allow the delicate brain matter to harden and ossify until his whole life is barren and fruitless.
every thought tends to become a material thing. Our desires are seed thoughts that have a tendency to sprout and grow and blossom and bear fruit. We are sowing these seeds every day. What shall the harvest be? Each of us today is the result of his past thinking. Later we shall be the result of what we are now thinking. We create our own character, personality and environment by the thought which we originate, or entertain. Thought seeks its own. The law of mental attraction is an exact parallel to the law of atomic affinity. Mental currents are as real as electric, magnetic or heat currents. We attract the currents with which we are in harmony are we selecting those which will be conducive to our success. This is the important question. Lines of least resistance are formed by the constant action of the mind. The activity of the brain reacts upon the particular faculty of the brain employed. The latent power of the mind is developed by constant exercise. Each form of its activity becomes more perfect by practice. Exercises for the development of the mind present a variety of motives for consideration. They involve the development of the perceptive faculties, the cultivation of the emotions, the quickening of the imagination, the symmetrical unfoldment of the intuitive faculty, which, without being able to give a reason frequently impels or prohibits choice, and finally the power of the mind may be cultivated by the development of the moral character. The greatest man, said Seneca, is he who chooses right with invincible determination. The greatest power of the mind, then, depends upon its exercise in moral channels, and therefore requires that every conscious mental effort should involve a moral end. A developed moral consciousness modifies consideration of motives, and increases the force and continuity of actions, consequently the well-developed symmetrical character necessitates good physical, mental and moral health, and this combination creates initiative, power, resistless force, and necessarily success. It will be found that nature is constantly seeking to express harmony in all things, is forever trying to bring about an harmonious adjustment, for every discord, every wound, every difficulty, therefore when thought is harmonious, nature begins to create the material conditions, the possession of which is necessary in order to make up an harmonious environment. When we understand that mind is the great creative power, what does not become possible? with desire as the great creative energy, can we not see why desire should be cultivated, controlled and directed in our lives and destinies? Men and women of strong mentality, who dominate those around them, and often those far removed from them, really emanate currents charged with power which, coming in contact with the minds of others, causes the desires of the latter to be in accord with the mind of the strong individuality. Great masters of men possess this power to a marked degree. Their influence is felt far and near, and they secure compliance with their wishes by making others want to act in accord with them. In this way men of strong desire and imagination may and do exert powerful influence over the minds of others, leading the latter in the way desired. The magnetic persons attract, allure and draw. They are emotional, and captured the will of others. No man is ever created without the inherent power in himself to help himself. The personality that understands its own intellectual and moral power of conquest will certainly assert itself. It is this truth which an infamine world craves today. The possibility of asserting a slumbering intellectual courage that clearly discerns, and a moral courage that grandly undertakes is open to all. There is a divine potency in every human being. We speak of the sun as rising and, setting, though we know that this is simply an appearance of motion. To our senses the earth is apparently standing still, and yet we know it is revolving rapidly. We speak of a bell as a, sounding body, yet we know that all that the bell can do is to produce vibrations in the air. When these vibrations come at the rate of sixteen a second they cause a sound to be heard in the mind. It is possible for the mind to hear vibrations up to the rate of 38,000 a second. When the number increases beyond this all is silence again, so that we know that the sound is not in the bell, it is in our own mind. We speak and even think of the sun as, giving light, 
yet we know it is simply giving forth energy which produces vibrations in the ether at the rate of 400 trillion a second, causing what are termed light waves, so that we know that what we call light is simply a mode of motion, and the only light that there is, is the sensation caused in the mind by the motion of these waves. When the number of vibrations increases, the light changes in color, each change in color being caused by shorter and more rapid vibrations, so that although we speak of the rose as being red, the grass as being green, or the sky as being blue, we know that these colors exist only in our minds, and are the sensation experienced by us as the result of the vibrations of light. When the vibrations are reduced below 400 trillion a second, they no longer affect us as light but we experience the sensation of heat. So we have come to know that appearances exist for us only in our consciousness. Even time and space become annihilated, time being only the experience of succession, there being no past or future except as a thought relation to the present. In the last analysis, therefore, we know that one principle governs and controls, all there is. Every atom is forever conserved, whatever is parted with must inevitably be received somewhere. It cannot perish and it only exists for use. It can go only where it is attracted, and therefore required. We can receive only what we give, and we may give only to those who can receive, and it remains with us to determine our rate of growth and the degree of harmony that we shall express. The laws under which we live are designed solely for our advantage. These laws are immutable and we cannot escape from their operation. All the great eternal forces act in solemn silence, but it is in our power to place ourselves in harmony with them and thus express a life of comparative peace and happiness. Difficulties, enharmonies, obstacles, indicate that we are either refusing to give out what we no longer need, or refusing to accept what we require. Growth is attained through an exchange of the old for the new, of the good for the better, it is a conditional or reciprocal action for each of us is a complete thought entity and the completeness makes it possible for us to receive only as we give. We cannot obtain what we lack if we tenaciously cling to what we have. The principle of attraction operates to bring to us only what may be to our advantage. We are able consciously to control our conditions as we come to sense the purpose of what we attract, and are able to extract from each experience only what we require for our further growth. Our ability to do this determines the degree of harmony or happiness we attain. The ability to appropriate what we require for our growth continually increases as we reach higher planes and broader visions, and the greater our ability to know what we require, the more certain we shall be to discern its presence, to attract it and to absorb it. Nothing may reach us except what is necessary for our growth. All conditions and experiences that come to us do so for our benefit. Difficulties and obstacles will continue to come until we absorb their wisdom and gather from them the essentials of further growth. That we reap what we sow, is mathematically exact. We gain permanent strength exactly to the extent of the effort required to overcome our difficulties. The inexorable requirements of growth demand that we exert the greatest degree of attraction for what is perfectly in accord with us. Our highest happiness will be best attained through our understanding of and conscious cooperation with natural laws. Our mind forces are often bound by the paralyzing suggestions that come to us from the crude thinking of the race, and which are accepted and acted upon without question. Impressions of fear, of worry of disability and of inferiority are given us daily. These are sufficient reasons in themselves why men achieve so little why the lives of multitudes are so barren of results, when all the time there are possibilities within them which need only the liberating touch of appreciation and wholesome ambition to expand into real greatness. Women, perhaps even more than men, have been subject to these conditions. This is true because of their finer susceptibilities making them more open to thought vibrations from other minds, and because the flood of negative and repressive thoughts has been aimed more especially at them. But it is being overcome. 
Florence Nightingale overcame it when she rose in the Crimea to heights of tender sympathy and executive ability before unknown among women. Clara Barton, the head of the Red Cross, overcame it when she wrought a similar work in the armies of the Union. Jenny Lid overcame it when she showed her ability to command enormous financial rewards while at the same time gratifying the passionate desire of her nature and reaching the front rank of her day in musical art. And there is a long list of women singers, philanthropists, writers and actresses who have proved themselves capable of reaching the greatest literary, dramatic, artistic and sociological achievement. Women as well as men are beginning to do their own thinking. They have awakened to some conception of their possibilities. They demand that if life holds any secrets, these shall be disclosed. At no previous time has the influence and potency of thought received such careful and discriminating investigation. While a few seers have grasped the great fact that mind is the universal substance, the basis of all things, never before has this vital truth penetrated the more general consciousness. Many minds are now striving to give this wonderful truth definite utterance. Modern science has taught us that light and sound are simply different intensities of motion, and this may lead to discoveries of forces within man that could not have been conceived of until this revelation was made. A new era has dawned, and now, standing in its light, man sees something of the vastness of the meaning of life something of its grandeur. Within that life is the germ of infinite potencies. One feels convinced that man's possibility of attainment cannot be measured, that boundary lines to his onward march are unthinkable. Standing on this height, he finds that he can draw new power to himself from the infinite energy of which he is a part. 2. Some men seem to attract success, power, wealth, attainment, with very little conscious effort, others conquer with great difficulty still others fail altogether to reach their ambitions, desires and ideals. Why is this so? Why should some men realize their ambitions easily, others with difficulty, and still others not at all? The cause cannot be physical, else the most perfect men, physically, would be the most successful. The difference, therefore, must be mental must be in the mind, hence mind must be the creative force, must constitute the sole difference between men. It is mind, therefore, which overcomes environment and every other obstacle in the path of men. It is the actualizing of interior quality through the creative power of thought which has given us great leaders like Alexander, Napoleon, Cromwell, Marlborough and Washington, captains of industry like Carnegie, Morgan, Rockefeller and Lee Holm, inventors like Stevenson, Morse, Marconi, Edison, Tesla, and hosts of others. If, then, the only difference between men lies in their ability to think, to use and control their thought, to develop it if the secret of all success, all power, all attainment is the creative power of mind, the force of thought surely the ability of think correctly should become the paramount object of every man. When the creative power of thought is fully understood, its effect will be seen to be marvelous. But such results cannot be secured without proper application, diligence and concentration. The student will find that the laws governing in the mental and spiritual world are as fixed and infallible as in the material world. To secure the desired results, then, it is necessary to know the law and to comply with it. A proper compliance with the law will be found to produce the desired result with invariable exactitude. The student who learns that power comes from within, that he is weak only because he has depended on help from outside, and who unhesitatingly throws himself on his own thought, instantly writes himself, stands erect, assumes a dominant attitude, and works miracles. Scientists tell us that we live in the universal ether. This is formless, of itself, but it is pliable, and forms about us, in us and around us, according to our thought and word. We set it into activity by that which we think. Then that which manifests to us objectively is that we have thought or said. Thought is governed by law. The reason we have not manifested more faith is because of lack of understanding. 
we have not understood that everything works in exact accordance with definite law. The law of thought is as definite as the law of mathematics, or the law of chemistry, or the law of electricity, or the law of gravitation. When we begin to understand that happiness, health, success, prosperity and every other condition or environment are results, and that these results are created by right thinking, either consciously or unconsciously, we shall realize the importance of a working knowledge of the laws governing thought. Those coming into a conscious realization of the power of thought find themselves in possession of the best that life can give, substantial things of a higher order become theirs, and these sublime realities are so constituted that they can be made tangible parts of daily personal life. They realize a world of higher power, and keep that power constantly working. This power is inexhaustible, limitless, and they are therefore carried forward from victory to victory. Obstacles that seem insurmountable are overcome. Enemies are changed to friends, conditions are overcome, elements transformed, fate is conquered. The supply of good is inexhaustible, and the demand can be made along whatever lines we may desire. This is the mental law of demand and supply. Our circumstances and environment are formed by our thoughts, we have, perhaps, been creating these conditions unconsciously. If they are unsatisfactory, the remedy is to consciously alter our mental attitude and see our circumstances adjust themselves to the new mental condition. There is nothing strange or supernatural about this, it is simply the law of being. The thoughts which take root in the mind will certainly produce fruit after their kind. The greatest schemer cannot gather grapes of thorns, or figs of thistles. To improve our conditions we must first improve ourselves. Our thoughts and desires will be the first to show improvement. To be in ignorance of the laws governing in the mental world is to be like a child playing with fire, or a man manipulating powerful chemicals without a knowledge of their nature and relations. This is universally true, because mind is the one great cause which produces all conditions in the lives of men and women. Admitting that you agree with everything that has been stated, thus far, and most persons will take no exception to anything that has been said, it still remains to make a practical application of the law. In order to take advantage of this law, and put ourselves into harmonious relationship with it, so that the benefit may be made manifest in our lives, it is necessary to see that the conditions are all met for its proper operation. We may know the laws governing electricity, we may have all the proper mechanism, the lamps, the wires, the switches, and we may even know how to generate the power, but if the connections are not properly made, we can work the switch till doomsday and no light will appear, so with the law of attraction it is in operation all the time, everywhere, something is constantly being created, something is appearing, everything is continually changing, but to take advantage of this process, it is just as necessary to comply with the law as it is in the case of electricity or gravitation. Mind is creative and operates through the law of attraction. We are not to try to influence any to do what we think they should do. Each individual has a right to choose for himself, but aside from this we would be operating under the law of force, which is destructive in its nature and just the opposite of the law of attraction. A little reflection will convince you that all of the great laws of nature operate in silence and that the underlying principle is the law of attraction. It is only destructive processes such as earthquakes and catastrophes, that employ force. Nothing good is ever accomplished in that way. To be successful, attention must invariably be directed to the creative plane, it must never seek to deprive. You do not wish to take anything away from anyone else. You want to create something for yourself, and what you want for yourself you are perfectly willing that everyone else should have. You know that it is not necessary to take from one to give to another, but that the supply for all is abundant. Nature's storehouse of wealth is inexhaustible and if there seems to be a lack of supply anywhere it is only because the channels of distribution are as yet imperfect. Abundance is a natural law of the universe. The evidence of this law is conclusive, we see it on every hand. 
everywhere nature is lavish wasteful, extravagant. Nowhere is economy observed in any created thing. Profusion is manifested in everything. The millions and millions of trees and flowers and plants and animals and the vast scheme of reproduction where the process of creating and recreating is forever going on, all indicates the lavishness with which nature has made provision for man. That there is an abundance for everyone is evident, but that many seem to have been separated from this supply is also evident, they have not yet come into a realization of the universality of all substance and that mind is the active principle which starts causes in motion whereby we are related to the things we desire. It is evident, therefore, that he who fails to fully investigate and take advantage of the wonderful progress which is being made, in this last and greatest science, will soon be as far behind as the man who would refuse to acknowledge and accept the benefits which have accrued to mankind through an understanding of the laws of electricity. Of course, Mind creates negative conditions just as readily as favorable conditions, and when we consciously or unconsciously visualize every kind of lack, limitation and discord, we create these conditions, this is what many are unconsciously doing all the time. This law as well as every other law is no respecter of persons, but is in constant operation and is relentlessly bringing to each individual exactly what he has created, in other words whatsoever a man soweth that shall he also reap. Abundance, therefore, depends upon a recognition of the laws of abundance, and the fact that mind is not only the creator, but the only creator of all there is. Certainly nothing can be created, before we know that it can be created and then make the proper effort. There is no more electricity in the world today than there was fifty years ago, but until someone recognized the law by which it could be made of service we received no benefit, now that the law is understood, practically the whole world is lit by it. So with the law of abundance, it is only those who recognize the law and place themselves in harmony with it, who share in its benefits. A recognition of the law of abundance develops certain mental and moral qualities, among which are courage, loyalty, tact, sagacity, individuality and constructiveness. These are all modes of thought, and as all thought is creative, they manifest in objective conditions corresponding with the mental condition. This is necessarily true because the ability of the individual to think is his ability to act upon the universal mind and bring it into manifestation, it is the process whereby the individual becomes a channel for the differentiation of the universal. Every thought is a cause and every condition an effect. This principle endows the individual with seemingly transcendental possibilities, among which is the mastery of conditions through the creation and recognition of opportunities. This creation of opportunity implies the existence or creation of the necessary qualities or talents which are thought forces and which result in a consciousness of power which future events cannot disturb. It is this organization of victory or success within the mind, this consciousness of power within which constitutes the responsive harmonious action whereby we are related to the objects and purposes which we seek. This is the law of attraction in action, this law being the common property of all, can be exercised by any one having sufficient knowledge of its operation. Courage is that power of the mind which manifests in the love of mental conflict, it is a noble and lofty sentiment, it is equally fitted to command or obey both require courage. It often has a tendency to conceal itself. There are men and women, too, who apparently exist only to do what is pleasing to others, but when the time comes and the latent will is revealed, we find under the velvet glove an iron hand and no mistake about it. True courage is cool, calm and collected, and is never foolhardy, quarrelsome, ill-natured or contentious. Accumulation is the power to reserve and preserve a part of the supply which we are constantly receiving, so as to be in position to take advantage of the larger opportunities which will come as soon as we are ready for them. Has it not been said, to him that hath shall be given? All successful businessmen have this quality well developed. James J. Hill, who recently died leaving an estate of over $52 million, said, if you want to know whether you are destined to be a success or a failure in life, you can easily find out. 
The test is simple and it is infallible. Are you able to save money? If not, drop out. You will lose. You may think not, but you will lose as sure as you live. The seed of success is not in you. This is very good so far as it goes, but anyone who knows the biography of James J. Hill, knows that he acquired his $50 million by following the exact methods we have given. In the first place, he started with nothing, he had to use his imagination to idealize the vast railroad which he projected across the western prairies. He then had to come into a recognition of the law of abundance in order to provide the ways and means for materializing it, unless he had followed out this program he would never have had anything to save. Accumulativeness acquires momentum. The more you accumulate the more you desire and the more you desire the more you accumulate, so that it is but a short time until the action and reaction acquire a momentum that cannot be stopped. It must, however, never be confounded with selfishness, miserliness or penuriousness, they are perversions and will make any true progress impossible. Constructiveness is the creative instinct of the mind. It will be readily seen that every successful businessman must be able to plan, develop or construct. In the business world it is usually referred to as initiative. It is not enough to go along in the beaten path. New ideas must be developed, new ways of doing things. It manifests in building, designing, planning, inventing, discovering, improving. It is a most valuable quality and must be constantly encouraged and developed. Every individual possesses it in some degree, because he is a center of consciousness in that infinite and eternal energy from which all things proceed. Water manifests on three planes, as ice, as water and as steam, it is all the same compound, the only difference is the temperature, but no one would try to drive an engine with ice, convert it into steam and it easily takes up the load. So with your energy, if you want it to act on the creative plane, you will have to begin by melting the ice with the fire of imagination, and you will find that the stronger the fire, and the more ice you melt, the more powerful your thought will become, and the easier it will be for you to materialize your desire. Sagacity is the ability to perceive and cooperate with natural law. True sagacity avoids trickery and deceit as it would the leprosy. It is the product of that deep insight which enables one to penetrate into the heart of things and understand how to set causes in motion which will inevitably create successful conditions. Tact is a very subtle and at the same time a very important factor in business success. It is very similar to intuition. To possess tact one must have a fine feeling, must instinctively know what to say or what to do. In order to be tactful one must possess sympathy and understanding, that understanding which is so rare, for all men see and hear and feel, but how desperately few, understand. Tact enables one to foresee what is about to happen and calculate the result of actions. Tact enables us to feel when we are in the presence of physical, mental and moral cleanliness, for these are today invariably demanded as the price of success. Loyalty is one of the strongest links which bind men of strength and character. It is one which can never be broken with impunity. The man who would lose his right hand rather than betray a friend will never lack friends. The man who will stand in silent guard, until death, if need be, beside the shrine of confidence or friendship of those who have allowed him to enter will find himself linked with a current of cosmic power which will attract desirable conditions only. It is inconceivable that such a one should ever meet with lack of any kind. Individuality is the power to unfold our own latent possibilities, to be a law unto ourselves, to be interested in the race rather than the goal. Strong men care nothing for the flock of imitators who trot complacently behind them. They derive no satisfaction in the mere leading of large numbers, or the plaudits of the mob. This pleases only petty natures and inferior minds. Individuality glories more in the unfolding of the power within than in the servility of the weakling. Individuality is a real power inherent in all and the development and consequent expression of this power enables one to assume the responsibility of directing his own footsteps rather than stampeding after some self-assertive bellwether.
truth is the imperative condition of all well-being. To be sure, to know the truth and to stand confidently on it is a satisfaction beside which no other is comparable. Truth is the underlying verity, the condition precedent to every business or social relation. Truth is the only solid ground in a world of conflict, doubt and danger. Every act not in harmony with truth, whether through ignorance or design, cuts the ground from under our feet, leads to discord, inevitable loss, and confusion, for while the humblest mind can accurately foretell the result of ever correct action, the greatest, most profound and penetrating mind loses its way hopelessly and can form no conception of the results due to a departure from correct principles. Those who establish within themselves the requisite elements of true success have established confidence, organized victory, and it only remains for them to take such steps from time to time as the newly awakened thought force will direct, and herein rests the magical secret of all power. Less than 10% of our mental processes is conscious, the other 90% is subconscious and unconscious so that he who would depend upon his conscious thought alone for results is less than 10%. Efficient. Those who are accomplishing anything worthwhile are those who are enabled to take advantage of this greater storehouse of mental wealth. It is in the vast domain of the subconscious mind that great truths are hidden, and it is here that thought finds its creative power, its power to correlate with its object, to bring out of the unseen the seen. Those familiar with the laws of electricity understand the principle that electricity must always pass from a higher to a lower potentiality and can therefore make whatever application of the power they desire. Those not familiar with this law can effect nothing, and so with the law governing in the mental world, those who understand that mind penetrates all things, is omnipresent and is responsive to every demand, can make use of the law and can control conditions circumstances and environment, the uninformed cannot use it because they do not know it. The fruit of this knowledge is, as it were, a gift of the gods, it is the truth that makes men free, not only free from every lack and limitation, but free from sorrow, worry and care, and is it not wonderful to realize that this law is no respecter of persons, that it makes no difference what your habit of thought may be the way has been prepared. With the realization that this mental power controls and directs every other power which exists, that it can be cultivated and developed, that no limitation can be placed upon its activity, it will become apparent that it is the greatest fact in the world, the remedy for every ill, the solution for every difficulty, the gratification of every desire, in fact, that it is the Creator's magnificent provision for human emancipation. 3. The scientific spirit now dominates every field of effort, relations of cause and effect are no longer ignored. The discovery of a reign of law marked an epoch in human progress. It eliminated the element of uncertainty and caprice from men's lives, and substituted law, reason and certitude. Men now understand that for every result there is an adequate and definite cause, so that when a given result is desired, they seek the condition by which alone this result may be attained. The basis upon which all law rests was discovered by inductive reasoning which consists of comparing a number of separate instances with one another until the common factor which gives rise to them all is seen. It is this method of study to which the civilized nations owe the greater part of their prosperity and the more valuable part of their knowledge, it has lengthened life, it has mitigated pain, it has spanned rivers, it has brightened night with the splendor of day, extended the range of vision, accelerated motion, annihilated distance, facilitated intercourse, and enabled men to descend into the sea and to soar in the air. What wonder then that men soon endeavored to extend the blessings of this system of study to their method of thinking, so that when it became plainly evident that certain results followed a particular method of thinking it only remained to classify these results. This method is scientific and it is the only method by which we shall be permitted to retain, that degree of liberty and freedom which we have been accustomed to look upon as an inalienable right because a people is safe at home and in the world only if national preparedness means such things as growing surplus of health, 
accumulated efficiency in public and private business of whatever sort, continuous advance in the science and art of acting together, and the increasingly dominant endeavor to make all of these and all other aspects of national development center and revolve about ascending life, single and collective, for which science, art and ethics furnish guidance and controlling motives. The master key is based on absolute scientific truth and will unfold the possibilities that lie dormant in the individual, and teach how they may be brought into powerful action, to increase the person's effective capacity, bringing added energy, discernment, vigor and mental elasticity. The student who gains an understanding of the mental laws which are unfolded will come into the possession of an ability to secure results hitherto undreamed of and which has rewards hardly to be expressed in words. It explains the correct use of both the receptive and active elements of the mental nature, and instructs the student in the recognition of opportunity, it strengthens the will and reasoning powers, and teaches the cultivation and best uses of imagination, desire, the emotions and the intuitional faculty. It gives initiative, tenacity of purpose, wisdom of choice intelligent sympathy and a thorough enjoyment of life on its higher planes. The master key teaches the use of mind power, true mind power, not any of the substitutes and perversions, it has nothing to do with hypnotism, magic or any of the more or less fascinating deceptions by which many are led to think that something can be had for nothing. The master key cultivates and develops the understanding which will enable you to control the body and thereby the health. It improves and strengthens the memory. It develops insight, the kind of insight which is so rare, the kind which is the distinguishing characteristic of every successful businessman, the kind which enables men to see the possibilities as well as the difficulties in every situation, the kind which enables men to discern opportunity close at hand, for thousands fail to see opportunities almost within their grasp while they are industriously working with situations which under no possibility can be made to realize any substantial return. The master key develops mental power which means that others instinctively recognize that you are a person of force, of character that they want to do what you want them to do, it means that you attract men and things to you, that you are what some people call, lucky, that things come your way that you have come into an understanding of the fundamental laws of nature, and have put yourself in harmony with them, that you are in tune with the infinite, that you understand the law of attraction, the natural laws of growth, and the psychological laws on which all advantages in the social and business world rest. Mental power is creative power, it gives you the ability to create for yourself, it does not mean the ability to take something away from someone else. Nature never does things that way. Nature makes two blades of grass grow where one grew before, and mind power enables men to do the same thing. The master key develops insight and sagacity, increased independence, the ability and disposition to be helpful, it destroys distrust, depression, fear, melancholia, and every form of lack, limitation and weakness, including pain and disease. It awakens buried talents, supplies initiative, force, energy, vitality. It awakens an appreciation of the beautiful in art, literature and science. It has changed the lives of thousands of men and women, by substituting definite principles for uncertain and hazy methods and principles are the foundation upon which every system of efficiency must rest. Albert Gary, the chairman of the United States Steel Corporation, said, the services of advisors, instructors, efficiency experts in successful management are indispensable to most business enterprises of magnitude, but I deem the recognition and adoption of right principles of vastly more importance. The master key teaches right principles, and suggests methods for making a practical application of the principles, in that it differs from every other course of study. It teaches that the only possible value which can attach to any principle is in its application. Many read books, take home study courses, attend lectures all their lives without ever making any progress in demonstrating the value of the principles involved. 
the master key suggests methods by which the value of the principles taught may be demonstrated and put in actual practice in the daily experience. There is a change in the thought of the world. This change is silently transpiring in our midst, and is more important than any which the world has undergone since the downfall of paganism. The present revolution in the opinions of all classes of men, the highest and most cultured of men as well as those of the laboring class, stands unparalleled in the history of the world. Science has of late made such vast discoveries, has revealed such an infinity of resources, has unveiled such enormous possibilities and such unsuspected forces, that scientific men more and more hesitate to affirm certain theories as established and indubitable or to deny certain other theories as absurd or impossible, and so a new civilization is being born, customs, creeds, and cruelty are passing, vision, faith and service are taking their place. The fetters of tradition are being melted off from humanity, and as the dross of materialism is being consumed, thought is being liberated and truth is rising full-orbed before an astonished multitude. The whole world is on the eve of a new consciousness, a new power and a new realization of the resources within the self. The last century saw the most magnificent material progress in history. The present century will produce the greatest progress in mental and spiritual power. Physical science has resolved matter into molecules, molecules into atoms, atoms into energy, and it has remained for Sir Ambrose Fleming, in an address before the Royal Institution, to resolve this energy into mind. He says, in its ultimate essence, energy may be incomprehensible by us except as an exhibition of the direct operation of that which we call mind or will. Let us see what are the most powerful forces in nature. In the mineral world everything is solid and fixed. In the animal and vegetable kingdom it is in a state of flux, forever changing, always being created and recreated. In the atmosphere we find heat, light and energy. Each realm becomes finer and more spiritual as we pass from the visible to the invisible, from the coarse to the fine, from the low potentiality to high potentiality. When we reach the invisible we find energy in its purest and most volatile state. And as the most powerful forces of nature are the invisible forces, so we find that the most powerful forces of man are his invisible forces, his spiritual force, and the only way in which the spiritual force can manifest is through the process of thinking. Thinking is the only activity which the spirit possesses, and thought is the only product of thinking. Addition and subtraction are therefore spiritual transactions, reasoning is a spiritual process, ideas are spiritual conceptions, questions are spiritual searchlights and logic, argument and philosophy is spiritual machinery. Every thought brings into action certain physical tissue, parts of the brain, nerve or muscle. This produces an actual physical change in the construction of the tissue. Therefore it is only necessary to have a certain number of thoughts on a given subject in order to bring about a complete change in the physical organization of man. This is the process by which failure is changed to success. Thoughts of courage, power, inspiration, harmony are substituted for thoughts of failure, despair, lack, limitation and discord, and as these thoughts take root, the physical tissue is changed and the individual sees life in a new light, old things have actually passed away, all things have become new, he is born again, this time born of the spirit, life has a new meaning for him, he is reconstructed and is filled with joy, confidence, hope, energy. He sees opportunities for success to which he was heretofore blind. He recognizes possibilities which before had no meaning for him. The thoughts of success with which he has been impregnated are radiated to those around him, and they in turn help him onward and upward, he attracts to him new and successful associates, and this in turn changes his environment, so that by this simple exercise of thought, a man changes not only himself, but his environment circumstances and conditions. You will see, you must see, that we are at the dawn of a new day, that the possibilities are so wonderful, so fascinating, so limitless as to be almost bewildering. 
A century ago any man with an aeroplane or even a Gatling gun could have annihilated a whole army equipped with the implements of warfare then in use. So it is at present. Any man with a knowledge of the possibilities contained in the master key has an inconceivable advantage over the multitude.